Hello everyone. Great to see you. I've got the wrong chat up on screen. <laughs> I thought it was all going so well. Well, great to see you all. Thanks for, so much for coming over and uh, having a bit of a sing with me. Uh, I thought that was a great, great little, uh, little bit of stainer, just to contrast with all the lovely Baroque music and, uh, and early music and all the cheeky musical songs, something a little bit different. So actually, I'm going to turn myself all the way up. There we go. Great stuff. Well, it looks like lots of people are having a nice cup of tea. And you know what? That's a perfect thing to do when it comes to the deep dives, um, because it's it's very much an opportunity for you to sit and listen and let me waffle on for a bit. <laughs> and uh, today, oh my goodness, I could waffle on for hours about the subject of today's deep dive, everyone. It is the fifth of six composing sessions. And having looked at some, frankly, quite challenging musical styles last week, I did ask a lot of you. Um, I thought I'd give you a bit of a treat this week. We're going to look at minimalism. And I think by the end of today, those of you who'd never even heard of the style before will, will be able to, to identify it when you hear it in the wild. And I think for some of you, you're going to come out of today's deep dive session um, with a whole load of lovely, lovely music to enjoy. And the kind of music that I'll be sharing and, and um, suggesting for you today is exactly the kind of thing you need for relaxation and for mindfulness and for just it letting go, everybody. So let's uh, let's get started, shall we? Um, as I say, today is all about minimalism. Let me get my slide up on screen. Check that's all working. Marvellous. So, of course, folks, we're in the middle of one, well, actually coming to the end of a series of deep dives looking at composing. Um, we've ex explored uh, randomly pulling notes out of a bag. We've explored using a sequencer. We've explored using a score program. Last week, we were looking at uh, using what's called tone rows uh, as invented by uh, the great Schoenberg and coming up with music that sounds extraordinarily difficult to listen to but is very very clever. Well what we have this week is no less clever but is really really lovely. So we'll start in a minute with a, just a little bit of background as to where minimalism sits in uh, in the pantheon of, of 20th and 21st century music. Um, we'll then talk about some of the more prominent composers including uh, the great John Cage, Steve Reich and of course Philip Glass and then using Philip Glass's influence uh, we're going to compose a very quick little piece using a piece of software so that's the plan and uh, hope you enjoy everybody so let's start off by just reminding ourselves uh, where we are in terms of the uh, of, of the timeline, if you like, of music. And I showed you this one last week to really illustrate the, the fact that the 20th century, and now the 21st century, as, it, as, it's, uh, as we're in, um, really is, is where music fractured and you started to see all of these different styles uh, developing. And of course, this is really, this is a very, very tiny fraction of the styles of music, of course, that developed in the 20th century. Uh, it's very much Western classical, art music you know you won't find film music there you won't find much in the way of opera you won't certainly won't find uh, anything popular <laughs> as by which i mean uh blues jazz rock and roll none of that's on here this is you know this is what you think of as classical music uh, and if we see here in 1890 as debussy's writing his wonderful prelude de la Primedi, you also see the emergence of impressionism minimalism is very much towards the end of the 20th century it's it's sort of in the in the latter course a latter third of the 20th century and is still around today and it's it was a, a reaction if you like to the music of the 60s in particular something called music concrete and electronic music which is really just experimental to the extreme and uh, if you're looking for a, a, a type of music um, to give yourself an extreme headache well then listen to a whole load of music concrete because it's not really designed to be listened to and relaxed to it's designed to challenge you in the way modern art is designed to challenge you. So all this is a long-winded way of saying minimalism was a reaction to everybody taking everything to extremes, including serialism. If you remember last week, we were looking at, you know, just giving each note a number and then just literally making the notes follow that number, whether it sounded nice or not. And so what you end up with at this point of the 20th century is a whole load of composers who are fed up with overcomplicated music. Uh, and so the reaction to that is always always to simplify and you'll find that throughout musical history if you follow the baroque era to its logical conclusion with the music of bach and his son cpe bach you know it got so complicated and so incredibly clever in order to be a composer of any note at that point in the baroque era you had to do something completely different and what they came up with was to do away with a lot of the counterpoint and to write simple melodies. The same thing happened at the end of the classical, classical era. The Romantics brought in a simplified musical style, which then became more complicated. 
So the minimalists, well, let, let me just show you uh, my next slide, I think says it all. You know, what, how do you react to, uh, to music that's become incredibly complicated, un basically unlistenable to? Uh, well, it's to really come up with absolutely nothing at all. And our first composer today is very famous for having done exactly that. This fantastic composer here, Mr. John Cage, uh, a, a real visionary. And he's known for uh, particularly his, his, uh, his stints on TV in the 50s and 60s in the States and over here, um, sharing his experimental music. And if you look up John Cage uh, on YouTube after this, and you watch some of his earlier broadcasts, he's just absolutely fantastic. You know, uh, holding a stopwatch, and he sort of has a whole load of props in front of him, and he'll bang it, he'll, he'll ring a bell, and then he'll blow a whistle and he'll drop something in some water and it's just bizarre but it's experimental and it's getting people to think and what John Cage discovered uh, after a, a whole well after a lifetime really of creating experimental music is that he he stumbled upon something very very important which is all music all music is comprised of a combination of sound and silence and what he wondered is I wonder what would happen if I just wrote a piece and instead of uh, mixing sound and silence, what if I wrote a piece that was entirely silent? And that's what he did. He composed this piece here uh, called 4 Minutes and 33. And I actually, as you can see here, the score is on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that this is an educational broadcast is, is uh, a huge relief because, you know, this is copyright material. John Cage's 4 Minutes 33, you can buy the score. It is for any combination of instruments, I don't even quite see at the top here, but it says for any instrumental combination of instruments, and it's literally three movements where nobody plays anything, and the audience sits in silence, everybody sits in silence for a specific amount of time, and at the end, well, the, the, the audience claps, and the, the choir, orchestra, conductor will stand and bow and take that applause, because they have just performed a piece of music, a piece of music where no notes were played, and the question I always used to ask my students when I taught this was, is this music? And of course it is. It is music in the same way that sound put together is music, but it took John Cage to come up with this. Now, if you've never experienced a live performance of 4 Minutes 33, and all giggling aside, yes, it is silly that you've got people sitting there, and <clears throat> but actually it's, an, it's, it's a very profound experience being in a performance of 4 Minutes 33, because think about this. When was the last time that you were sat in a room and, and obviously pandemic you know, notwithstanding, when did you last sit in, with a, an audience in absolute silence for more than two minutes? It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. So after that first minute of awkwardness and a few people <coughs> coughing and <coughs> trying not to, you know, uh, m m make emissions and so on, um, people start to relax and they start to appreciate the sound of nothing around them and of breath and... And so 4 minutes 33 is a really, really important, very minimalist work because it literally is comprised of silence. And um, just one little uh, lovely little anecdote, but well, it's not lovely for him. If There's a composer called Mike Batt, who's famous for writing, uh, well, certainly famous here in the UK, for writing the music for the Wombles. Um, and he's also uh, best known, I think, for, for being the producer for Hayley Western, Ra, who's a, a wonderful singer. He produced an album uh, back at the start of the, the turn of the century, um, the turn of the 21st century, and it had some... Uh, he had some extra space left over, and so he thought, for a joke, he'd put on a, a couple of silent tracks and put, you know, in tribute to John Cage. Sadly for him, John Cage's estate caught wind of this and sued him. Bear in mind, these were silent tracks on his CD. He was sued and he lost, and he had to pay a fortune uh, in, in royalties to John Cage for a silent track. That's how significant John Cage's contribution was. Okay, so that John Cage is, is in, in some ways, is the father of minimalism. He is an incredibly important composer, an experimental composer, and I think it's fair to say that 4 Minutes 33 is about as minimalist as it can get. Now, we're going to move on and look at another composer in a minute, but first, I want to talk just briefly about where the influences for uh, minimalist music came from. And there are two particular influences in world music, uh, one of which is the music of Indonesia. 
And you can see here, uh, over on the left-hand side of the slide, you've got uh, this amazing uh, combination of instruments. This is called the Gamelan. And the Gamelan is an orchestra of its own. And it comprises a number of instruments that you play with mallets, uh, called slendro, and uh, various pots, which are called pelogs, and gongs. Gong being an Indonesian word, uh, coming from these, this wonderful, wonderful ensemble. And the Gamelan is a sacred instrument. Okay, it is quite literally a sacred instrument. You must take your shoes off to play the gamelan. You must treat it with incredible respect. The gamelan is the only instrument in the world which has been granted human rights. It is a sacred object. Uh, and if you ever get the opportunity to play in a gamelan workshop, I would say to all of you, take that opportunity. It will change your life. So gamelan music is highly repetitive and has a sort of shimmering texture. Ding, 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 ding. Patterns and patterns repeating and repeating. The other style that fed into minimalist music was African music, and in particular, polyrhythmic drumming. And this is where, well, if you take the word polyrhythmic and you break it down, rhythmic, you know, notes played to a pulse. Poly meaning many, so polyrhythms means lots and lots of different rhythms overlapping and working together. And if you listen to African djembe drumming or anything like that, you'll hear that incredibly complicated, multifaceted rhythmic intensity going because the, well, the drums don't have uh, the same range as, of pitches as, uh, as tuned instruments. So, you know, it's the, the rhythmic intensity is what gives a lot of this uh, African drumming it, it, its appeal. And so the combination of shimmering repetitive textures and polyrhythms from African music combined in the brains of some very, very influential musicians, in particular, of this chap here, this chap called Steve Reich. Okay, now Steve Reich's music is wonderful and I would recommend it to all of you. John Cage's music is a little bit more challenging, but jo uh, Steve Reich is, is an absolute genius. He's still alive today, still producing music, uh, one of the most important and influential composers of the last 50 years. And um, I've got at the end of today's t uh, talk, I've got a list of pieces that you're going to want to listen to. Um, and I would recommend Different Trains to any of you, beautiful piece, um, and so many others. But the piece I want to talk about is on screen at the moment. Um, the piece I want to talk about is actually the, the one you can see the score for. And this is a piece called Clapping Music. And again, you can watch this live, well, watch it live, you can watch a recording of it, uh, recorded live uh, on YouTube after this. And you see Steve Reich uh, back in the, I believe it was the 70s, 1972, he wrote this uh, with one of, his, uh, one of his colleagues and they perform it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to very quickly talk you through this because... You know, if you if you want to get your head around minimalism, you need to understand it, it really just how sparse the material you're working with needs to be. And so Steve Reich came up with this very simple pattern, which you can just about make up make out at the top of the score here. And it's just a clapping pattern which goes over the course of one bar. It's da 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 da. Okay, and that, and all you do is you have two performers. I say all you do. You have two performers, and you start in unison. Everyone clapping together. Da 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 da. And the pattern is very mathematical. One two three. One two one one two. One two three. One two one one two. And then what happens when you've repeated that enough times is the person on the second clap, and again, if you peer at the score, you might just about be able to make it out, but that person on the second clap just shifts their pattern by one beat, by one quaver, and so they go out of sync with each other. And then when they've repeated it a number of times, they go out of sync another, another half beat, and then another, and then another. Over the course of the five, six minutes it takes to go all the way through, the piece gets out of sync and then drifts back into sync so that by the end the two claps are united and then it just stops. And what I'm going to do to just illustrate that, don't, I'm not going to show you the whole thing <laughs> because, uh, well, I, I know you're patient people, but there's, uh, you know, there's a limit to everything. But it's honestly, it's well worth watching this. It's fascinating watching it work. But this is kind of what it might sound like. So we've got two claps going on in unison. And if you're listening on headphones, you should hear these in different ears. There's your beat. One. And now out of sync. And you can hear now already, 
You've got something interesting. And now. Okay, and so throughout the piece, and, and it is a hard thing to do, just to keep this absolutely together. The concentration required is enormous, but by the end, of course, it all comes back together. And so after four minutes of shifting, shimmering texture, the claps are reunited. And how do we end? Well, none of this perfect cadence business. Listen, this is the end of the piece. And that's it. And that is typical, typical minimalism. It's about the expression. Once the expression is done, no, no more input is required. It just stops. All right, everybody, so that is a great example there, let's bring him back, of Mr. Reich and his incredible influence. And I would recommend his music to all of you. Now, we're going to move on uh, to the main event today, which is the wonderful composer Philip Glass. And uh, Philip Glass, again, is still alive today, still producing music. He's probably the best-known minimalist after Michael Nyman. And, of course, Michael Nyman's really very well known for his score for the piano, which is a min minimalist score. Um, Philip Glass, though, is, is a very, very very well-known composer, an Oscar winner many times over, and uh, he's written symphonies, operas, piano music, vocal music, choral music, and film scores, as you can see here. And his style, well, you'll recognise it, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, just a, a little bit of one of his pieces, and uh, this is from one of his Metamorphoses, okay? And this is, this is really at the heart of Philip Glass's style, combining those influences that Steve Reich um, brought on board, so that shimmering gamelan-type texture, yeah, da, 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 with the polyrhythmic idea where you might have one part going, yeah, da, 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 another one going, yeah, da, 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 and they're overlapping. Philip Glass combines those with the Western classical tradition to give you something that is unique. So I'm going to just play this pattern above. I've got to get the piano sound sounding nice and ominous. OK, so this, this is a very typical Philip Glass piece. It starts with a four-chord structure that goes. Pause there a second. So that is a very, very typical Philip Glass style, where you have this repeating pattern. Okay, if you hear music like that, chances are you're listening either to Philip Glass or to one of his uh, one of his influences or influences, I should say. Um, so what we're going to do now, folks, just in the last five ten minutes of the dive, is we're going to look at how you can capture a little bit of Philip Glass's style and come up with your own pieces. So how's everybody doing? Oh, bless you all. I'm glad you're, you're enjoying it. Fabulous. Instant chill out music, says Terry. So that's it. We're going to write our own chill out music. Now, before we do, what we need to do, we need to just have a quick look at our, our keyboard here. OK, because we need to identify a chord. We need a chord to start with. And, um, well, I mean, Philip Glass used E minor. I'm going to use D minor. OK, so a lot of the stuff we do is in F and in D. There's a good keys for us. So what I've got here is, look, I've got little, little buttons here so I can show the chord. How about that? Oh. OK, there's my D minor chord, D, F, A. And let's say that we're going to use that as our first chord, because we are, OK? If I just play that over and over again... Well, it's OK. But after a while, it gets a little bit intense. You start thinking, well, where's the interest? Now, this is where the gamelan comes in. And Philip Glass's technique is usually to play the first two notes of the triad, so that would be the D and the F, and then put the A on its own. And there you have that gamelan influence. Dun, 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 Just that almost is quite hypnotic, isn't it? And if I just play that now. Mm -hmm. 
straight into oh, relaxing. I, I know where I am with this. There's a constant pattern. Now, what Philip Glass does, though, as we saw from this slide here, is he always has a four chord pattern, but this is the trick. He will try, where possible, to change only one note between each chord. So let's say we do what Philip Glass would probably do, and in between the, the first and second, we move up to this. That's very Philip Glass, isn't it? And then the third one, we'll move this one down as well. OK, so do that again from the start. We've got D minor. Then. Then. And then we, we need one more pattern in the, the fourth bar to bring it back, so go. And then you just do those chords round and round and round. And it's entirely up to you when you're writing these things at home. If you think that doesn't sound right, well, you change it. But the way Glass does things is to try and change the minimal number of notes in between chords as possible. So as to just give you that sense of things are just evolving rather than starkly changing. So let's just have a little look at how you can use some software. Uh, we're going to use the great GarageBand, of course. Now, if you, uh, if you aren't on the Mac, you can get other... Uh, other fantastic sequences, but the reason I use this is it's free. If you've got an iPad, if you've got an uh, iPhone, if you've got a Mac, you can use this as well. So let's get this up on screen. Here's my garage band, everyone. And uh, all I've got in here is an empty thing with a, with a piano in. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to record one chord in. Now, I'm going to use my keyboard for this. But you can, of course, use the computer keyboard. If you don't have a music keyboard, you can use uh, this little thing and be bother here, and you can record that in one note at a time, or you can even use your typing keyboard to play the note. So that we S, F, and H to play it. All right, I'm going to use my keyboard. I'm going to record one chord in. Are we ready for this? Strap in, folks. Here we go. Here's the excitement. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That that's that's my chord. Let's have a look at it. So we can see if we double click, there is our chord. Now what I'm going to do is, as we learnt last week, we're going to quantize, and depending on what you do with your uh, with your software, quantizing will be in different places. It's down here, and I'm going to have this on the first beat of the bar. Okay, lovely stuff. Now the trick with minimalism and in fact the trick with using a sequencer is knowing that it's all about the repetition and copying and pasting basically so from that one chord what I'm going to do is I'm going to select it and I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste and so I'm going to put this uh, where I want it I'm going to paste this in basically put the what's called the playhead where you want it and paste and it will appear now if I grab all four of those and copy again I can end up with eight of them and so let's have a listen this is my one chord remember one chord played in OK, so far, good. Now, remember I said I didn't want dun 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 over and over and over again. I want something a little more interesting. So having played that chord in, remember it's the first two and then a note on its own. So I'm just going to now, like sculpting, I'm going to just delete some notes around this. So I'm going to delete the top one of the first chord and the bottom two of the next one. And then again, same thing, delete the top one and the bottom two. I'm trying to create a nice little pattern here. Let's have a listen to it. So far, so good. Now I can grab that and I can copy it again and copy it again and copy it again. And I've got four bars of... That's not going to set the world alight, but it's already a piece of music and it's already minimalist. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add another instrument. Uh, it says an electric piano. I don't want an electric piano. I think I'm going to have... Why don't we have a harp? We'll have a nice harp. So I'll put that in here. Here's my harp. Lovely. Lovely. So let's now take those chords that we recorded in and just copy them onto the harp part. OK, now if I play them together, they're not going to sound great because they're at the same pitch. So here's a little wee. So those of you who are following the garage band, garage band uh, fun, if you, uh, if you select your parts that you've played in here, you can then use the transpose button down at the bottom. And this is great because what you need to do is to drag it uh, to the left to lower the pitch or to the right to increase the pitch. And I'm going to drop it down by an octave. In fact, I might take it up by an octave, which is plus 12 because we know there are uh, 12 
tones in an octave. So let's listen. Already starting to sound a little bit more Philip Glassy. So now let's copy that again and let's add another part. And this time let's have a hmm, let's have a flute line. Okay, I like a nice flute in my music. So we shall have a nice legato flute and I shall paste that in. But we're gonna do something different with this because I don't want to just um I don't just want to have those chords going all the time. So I'm gonna go back to my notes here. Okay, so we've got da 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 da. Okay, so let's change this slightly. I'm going to instead of a shimmering sound. I'm going to put this, if you can see this, I'm going to make a little pattern. I'm going to go da 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 Okay, and if, in case anyone's wondering, how do you know where to put the lines vertically? If you, it's quite hard to show on the screen, but if you see here, you can actually see where the beats are. They're slightly stronger in the grid in the background, so you can see exactly where you're putting the beats. Let's have a listen to that, just the flute on its own. Oh. Let's have a listen to it. Lovely. So I'm going to copy that a few times. All right. Good, good, good. Copy, copy, copy. It's all about the copying and pasting, everybody. And notice this is still just the one chord. All right, so let's listen to it. Okay, lovely. Now, uh, just aware of time, so what we'll do very quickly is we'll now involve uh, what we were talking about uh, just before when we were looking at this business here. And so what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to leave it in the first bar. That's a nice chord. But in the second bar, we want to change one of the notes. So I'm going to change this one. I'm going to move it up by one. And then in the next bar, I'm going to do the same again. But I'm now going to move this one down by one as well. And then here, I'm going to do the same in the last bar. And I'm going to move this up. And this one here. So now, let's have a little listen. And then we can go back to the beginning. Now, I appreciate that if you've never experienced this before, uh, you would need to a, a bit of uh, research into which chord sequence you wanted and, and so on. But at the end of the day, I mean, I, I used to do this with, uh, with young people aged 11, 12. I said, just play a chord, change one note, change another, and just have it start to shimmer, start to create your own textures. Because once you do that, everybody, you know, you're starting, starting to sort of break away from this idea that music has to have a tune and it has to have a clear destination at all times. Actually, music can be about the journey. And minimalism is as much about the journey as anything else. It doesn't matter where you're going. It doesn't matter how fast you're getting there. We're all together on this journey, and we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to move together towards a destination ultimately. So let's have a little listen to that now. I've got the harp following the same thing. All I've done is I've changed the same note in the harp part to match the flute. Here we go. So you can see we're already starting to sound distinctly Glassian. And if you just bear with me two minutes, ladies and gentlemen, what I'll do is I'll do the same thing for the piano. And uh, then we'll have uh, a little opportunity to sing I Eat My Peas With Honey in a minimalist style. OK, so how's everybody doing for questions? Does anyone have any questions? Fabulous. Now, in terms of uh, people are saying, do I need to get GarageBand? If you have a Mac, if you have a uh, an iPad, if you have an iPhone, you can get this software. Um, it does take a bit of time to get used to, but the lovely thing about it is it's, it's actually quite user friendly, um, and there's a lot of guidance online as to how to use this stuff. So if you Google uh, tutorials on how to use uh, garage band uh, you'll find them without doubt the other thing to remember is that you can also get these this kind of thing for pc um uh, or for whichever platform you're using and i would just say to all of you you know a lot of this software is absolutely free there's no harm at all in just having a play around and just seeing what your knowledge of music particularly that you've gained over the last year uh, of all this lovely online singing let's see you know what what you've learned what you've picked up have a go all right so let's have a listen Now that sounds just like Philip Glass. So all we need now to finish off today is this. 
I eat my peas with honey. I've done so all my life. It makes the peas taste funny. But it keeps them on the knife. There we go. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I'm almost almost done um but that is a very very quick very quick uh, introduction to the wonderful style of minimalism which as i said i absolutely adore i owe my wonderful wife anna a huge uh, debt of thanks for introducing it to me and for for being such a, a passionate believer in the style because i am now a huge convert and what i want to finish with today everyone is just a list of pieces that I would recommend to you. If you've enjoyed this style, if you think, oh, actually, I like that, well, then have a listen to some of these pieces. Electric Counterpoint by Steve Reich, Different Trains. These are both masterworks. Different Trains in particular is very, very moving, very, very powerful. I won't say any more because I don't want to spoil it for you, but wait till you hear it. It's incredible. Terry Riley's In C is very challenging, but very interesting. Worth a listen. Uh, Michael Nyman's The Piano is beautiful. And there's some of Philip Glass's best film scores for you to enjoy. They're all available on various streaming services, even right here on YouTube. So there we go, everybody. There is our deep dive for this week. I could talk for hours about this musical style, but I need to let you get on with your day, you're busy people. So I look forward to seeing you for our next uh, home choir sing, which will be, of course, on Friday with our fun Friday. And uh, in the meantime, everybody, have a great day. And um, oh, just one more thing, uh, uh, just a quick limerick for you. There once was a composer named Glass. Philip Glass, Philip Glass, Philip Glass. Philip Glass, Philip Glass, Philip Glass, Philip Glass, Philip Glass, Philip Glass, Philip Glass. Bye, folks. <laughs>